Hi, today we're going to talk about the power that flowers have to entice beneficial predators to your garden to help you control your pest populations. Presented to you by the Jefferson Public Library's Seed Library. So why should you think about planting flowers in your vegetable garden? Well, in this video, we're going to talk about exactly what flowers do, what is the goal of companion planting, the benefits of companion planting, and then how this all works. And then lastly, specifically what flowers you need to plant in order to attract those predators to your garden to help you keep your pests under control. So what exactly do flowers do? Well, we, we know they bring in pollinators, and this is very good to have pollinators in your garden. Certain types of plants are insect dependent upon um, um, for pollination, and without pollinators, they're simply not going to produce their fruit. But flowers do so much more than simply bring in pollinators. They're going to attract beneficial insects, these are your predators, as well as your pest insects. And attracting pest insects is not necessarily a bad thing. When we have our seminar talking about trap cropping, we're going to talk about this extensively of how you attract the pest insects in order to protect the plants that you want to harvest. But we'll talk about that later. For the purpose of this video, we're specifically going to focus on attracting those beneficial predators to your garden. So if you plant, quote, the right kind of flowers, you're going to attract beneficial predators. They're going to help control your pest populations. Certain flowers are going to attract birds. And while birds can be a pest in things like blackberries, um, your, your songbirds and your hummingbirds are really a predator that you do want in your garden. Uh, they eat a multitude of pests, things like grasshoppers, caterpillars, which can decimate your garden overnight, uh, grubs and snails, uh, so many more. I, I love watching the birds land on my hanging basket poles and they're cracking snails. And all I can think about is that that is one less snail that is decimating my garden. So birds can be a very good predator that you do want to have in your garden. There are flowers and in plants that do more than just attract uh, insects. They also uh, can repel insects. And what the plants and flowers do is they secrete produce uh, chemicals. And these chemicals are either um, either attract um, insects, good, bad, um, or they repel insects. And we're going to talk about a flower um, later on that actually does both and how that's going to help you in your, your garden. You're also gonna find as you do companion planting that you're going to reduce the amount of pesticides that you use in your garden. You might, just might be able to even eliminate pesticides. And whether you reduce or eliminate, both are going to be very good. So some things to keep in mind as you do companion planting. Flowers are not a magic wand. If you have an aphid infestation and you figure out what flowers you need to plant to attract their predators, and they have a whole bunch, um, and then you go out the next morning, you're still gonna have your aphid infestation. If companion planting is not gonna fix your problems overnight, but over time, you are going to see a significant difference in the amount of pests in your garden. What you want to equate your companion plants, whether they're flowers or just plants, uh, you want to equate them with preventative medicine. We're going to talk a lot about planting in advance of a problem, and we're going to go over that extensively later on in, in the video. Companion planting is simply one tool in pest management. If you combine it with another tool like trap cropping, you're going to see even more good things happen happening in your garden. So in a nutshell, what planting in advance of a problem is. 
and we'll go over all the nitty-gritty details of exactly how all this works in just a moment. But in a nutshell, you want to identify the pest that you have. Uh, let's just say it's aphids. You want to identify the predator that eats aphids. One of them is ladybugs. And then you want to identify the plant or flower that attracts that predator. And then you want to have that in place before the pests even arrive. That's it in a nutshell. So the goal of companion planting is balance. Whenever anything is out of balance in your garden, that's when you have a problem. Uh, we see that most often with our pests when they get out of control. We're like, oh, what do I need to go buy to get rid of this pest? And uh, it's just it's because they're out of balance. There's not enough enough predators to keep them under control. And the same is true as if your predators get out of balance, that causes a problem too. So you want you want a, a balance between predator and pest. And it may take time to do this. You may have to figure out how many flowers you need to plant for your size garden. You may need to figure out the distance those flowers need to be in relation to the problem area. You may even need to figure out how many different varieties of flowers you need to plant. And so it's just going to take a little bit of time to figure it out um, for your specific, uh, what you're specifically dealing with. And then keep in mind too that if you kill all of your pests, again, you're, you're throwing things out of, out of balance. Your predators that you're attracting to your garden need something to eat. And that's where your pests are. What you're looking for in companion planting is a manageable amount of pests. You're working towards nature um, taking care of that problem for you. Uh, you you um, want to keep the pests at a level of where hand picking off takes care of the problem or spraying them with that, that water hose or squashing them. Uh, you just want a manageable amount. Plants can handle some damage. A little bit of nibbling is not going to kill your plants. So you want to keep that balance, that, that um, manageable amount of pests so that your predators have something to eat and your predators are keeping the pests from getting out of control in your garden. As you're doing companion planting, what we're trying to do is sort of get a paradigm shift in your thinking of thinking of pesticides as your absolute last resort. Because ideally, once you get this balance, nature is either going to help you, and maybe even take care of the problem for you. So some of the benefits of companion planting. You're going to definitely reduce the amount of chemicals, even whether they're, they're uh, even organic solutions, you're going to reduce that. You might even be able to eliminate them. When you use pesticides and even organic solutions like diatomaceous earth, they are indiscriminate killers. They're not going to be like, oh, that's a ladybug. We'll not kill that one, but we'll, we'll get the aphids. We'll just get the aphids. They, they don't discriminate between them. They just kill them both. Um, so reducing even the needs for uh, uh, organic solutions like diatomaceous earth is really going to help you out. So just we want to keep in mind that you just are looking for that balance. Um, so once you have that balance, you're going to use less of your pesticides or your organic solutions. Another benefit of companion planting is that it's simply going to make your life easier. Uh, you're going to find that it's more cost effective simply because you're not running out getting whatever pesticide that is going to help you with whatever problem it is and then of course that sometimes causes a problem and you have to run out and get something to help fix the problem that pesticide caused and uh, so you're going to be spending a lot less money on those kinds of things and those things can be expensive too um, if you save the seeds from your flowers or make use of things like the seed library where you can get seeds for free, uh, you're going to save even more money because if you purchase those flowers, that's going to cost you a lot of money. But if you save the seeds or get your seeds for free from like the Jefferson Seed Library, that's going to save you a lot of money as well. This one was a shocker for me that I saved time. I did very few flowers last year. I 
I didn't even know what I was doing with companion planting until I was doing the research. I just planted a few flowers and with the few flowers and absolutely basically no knowledge of what I was doing, I found that I saved so much time um, out in my garden, getting pan picking insects, uh, spraying my diatomaceous earth, and I got to do more of the fun things, um, just like harvesting and putting away the harvest, and even some things that aren't quite as much fun, but usually get pushed to the wayside because you know when you're working full time, you don't have all the time to go out there and weed and do that disgusting hot work. Um, but I actually had some time to do that because I wasn't out there spraying my diatomaceous earth all the time. So that, that was just such a gift uh, to be able to have more time. And anything that gives you more time is well worth the effort. So let's talk, let's start getting into the, the details of how this works. Planting in advance of a problem. What does it mean and how do you do it? So remember, flowers are preventative medicine. So what you're going to do when you plant in advance of a problem is you want to identify the pest or pests that you, that you had the most problems with. So for me, it was aphids. Uh, the aphids were only in my black eyed peas. So they left the rest of the garden alone but they were a huge problem. And they're actually the reason why this seminar came into being. So now that you know they're your pest, you wanna identify the predator. Fortunately, aphids have a lot, um, one of which are ladybugs. So now you know the pest and the predator, you wanna identify the flower or the plant that attracts that predator to your garden. One of the flowers that ladybugs, ladybugs like is Elysium. So I'm gonna to wanna to plant Elysium. But what's really important is to know when does that pest arrive? Remember we talked about how, uh, or mentioned I guess, that flowers, um, really all plants, they produce these chemicals that, um, that attract or repel insects. Well, when they are flowering, when they're in that reproductive stage, um, flowers and, and plants are more attractive to insects when they're flowering, when they're producing their fruit, when they're producing their seeds. So knowing when that pest is going to come to your garden is gonna be important. You may need to look up the life cycle of the pest that you, that you deal with. You may need to know when the eggs of that pest hatch out so you can have everything in place. It could be as simple as, for me, the aphids did not get into black-eyed peas until they were flowering and producing their fruit. They left it alone until then. So I know when the, the pest arrives, and at least for my situation, it was very simple and easy to learn them. So planning in advance. What I want to do, and this is true of whether um, it's aphids or not, I want to have my Elysium in place in my garden before uh, the aphids come to my black eyed peas. Preferably, I want that Elysium blooming before my black eyed peas do, uh, because again, it's gonna be more attractive to those ladybugs when it's in that reproductive state, when it's producing its flowers and then its seeds. Um, so I want the, the Elysium blooming and established in my garden before my black eyed peas are blooming and producing their fruit, because that's when the aphids come. And this way, I'm already in the process of attracting those predators so they're in place in my garden before the pests come and that way they help keep them under control so they don't get out of control like they were last year. So that's at planting in advance in the pro of the problem. You need to identify the pest, the predator, the flower, or the plant. You need to know when that pests arrive so you know when to plant your um, flower that's gonna attract the predator. And that could involve, uh, like for me, I started my Elysium indoors about eight weeks before planting time. That way it can be established and starting to get in that reproductive state before, um, before I plant my black eyed peas. So now let's get into 
what should you plant to attract the predators? So if you have aphids as a problem, fortunately they have multitudes of predators, one of which is ladybugs. We all know what the adult ladybug looks like. What you may not be familiar with is what the larval stage looks like. And this is the picture of the lar larval stage. If, if you see the larval ladybug in your garden, you want that there. Uh, the larval ladybug eats more aphids than the adult ladybugs do. And they can't fly, so they're stuck to their location. The flowers that attract ladybugs are Elysium, dill, bronze fennel, butterfly weed, cilantro, dandelions of all things, maybe don't kill all your dandelions, and then the wunderflower, the marigold. Now I want to pause and talk about cilantro for just a second. Cilantro is a very quick growing plant and it loves cool weather. It's going to bolt, which is go to flower, go to seed, as soon as it gets warm if it's hot. Um, so if you're going to use cilantro as a companion flower, you're going to you have a little bit of work ahead of you. Um, you're going to want to have um, cilantro, um, when the seeds of course are called coriander, you're going to want to plant that coriander. You're going to want some cilantro that's in that growing stage starting to bolt. You want some that's flowering and then some that's producing the seeds. And cilantro seeds are really easy to harvest and then you can just immediately go plant them again. So you're going to want some in all those, those stages that way you have the continuous supply of flowers for cilantro. Another uh, predator of aphids are lacewings. Uh, this is what the adult looks like. The larval looks like this alligator looking thing. And the, the um, larval um, lacewing eats more than just aphids. Um, they're a very good predator to have in your garden. But they like dill, cilantro again, cosmos, and dandelion. <laughs> Maybe you think about having a designated dandelion patch near your garden. I know for me, once I <laughs> learned this, I left a few dandelions near my, my garden. I don't want a whole lot, but I do want a few because they help attract predators that help get rid of my aphids and they're already blooming. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. They're already planting in advance of a problem, which is great. Uh, another predator of aphids are hoverflies. Uh, they have a lot of flowers that they that are that are attractive to them. Uh, keep in mind, this is what the larval stage looks like. This is not an evil caterpillar that's going to decimate your crops. This is something that's going to eat your your pests. So if you see that, you want to you want that in your garden. But they like zinnias, uh, cilantro again, cosmos, status, elysium again. Gloriosa daisy, the wunderflower, uh, parsley and dill. Uh, parsley, uh, keep in mind if you're going to use that as a companion flower, it is a biannual, which means it's going to flower in the second year of life. So if you're going to use parsley, this would be my suggestion. You would have some that's in that first year, so you're harvesting it for culinary purposes. And then you're going to have some that's in that second year that's going to bolt. Usually they uh, go to flower and go to seed uh, spring, early spring, somewhere in there. And then I would also recommend harvesting the seeds from the parsley, which is relatively easy to do, and then just replanting them. And that way you have this continuous supply of parsley flowers and stuff that you get to, get to enjoy in your cooking. Um, I would also recommend just doing one variety of parsley if you're going to save the seeds. That way you don't have to worry about cross-contamination or cross-pollination. Let's move on to a different predator, the tomato hornworm. hornworm. If you plant tomatoes or peppers, you are very familiar with this and how you can decimate your tomatoes so very quickly. They are such hungry caterpillars. Um, but birds and parasitic wasps are your friends when it comes to tomato hornworms. Birds, to attract them, um, you got your sunflowers, your cone flowers, which are also called echinacea, a black eyed Susans, um, uh, your rutabecchia, the gloriosa daisy is also a, a rutabecchia uh, in the rutabecchia family. 
Um, so you can plant that as well. Just keep in mind, if, especially if you do sunflowers, those bloom later in the season. They go to seed later in the season. Um, so you're going to want to have some other flowers blooming and going to seed um, before the sunflowers to attract your birds to help um, uh, with the tomato hornworms. Parasitic wasps are great for multitudes of reasons. They, they do like to go after the tomato hornworm, but they also do um, eat a lot of other insects. Uh, so I wanna go over three um, parasitic wasps. So if you see bees in your garden, you know they are your friends and that you want them there. Uh, this, this one here, uh, they like to eat moth, beetle, and fly larvae, larvae. And keep in mind, moth larvae are caterpillars. Um, and they like moth eggs, which hatch out into caterpillars. Um, and then they eat various insects, uh, both in the pupae stage as well as the adult stage. They're, they're very good. A few others, if you see, see either one of these, um, they help control moth butterfly beetle and fly larvae, both in the um, larval stage as well as the pupae stage. This black one I thought was so interesting because it lays its eggs inside the eggs of moths. And I just thought that was fascinating. A little creepy, but fascinating. Things that attract parasitic wasps. Oh, I wanna just mention too, if you see a tomato hornworm that has all these little white things sticking out of it, those are wasp, a parasitic wasp eggs. So if you see them, just let that tomato hormone be. It's going to die and all of those little white egg sacs are going to hatch out and you're gonna continue that life cycle of the parasitic wasp and then you'll have more parasitic wasps to help control your tomato hormones as well as all those other things that we just mentioned. But they like Elysium, that's good to know. Dill, cilantro, cosmos, status, lemon balm, parsley, the wunderflower, and we will talk why <laughs> marigold is the wunderflower in just a moment, um, and then also your, your zinnias. Now the next three um, insects, they eat a multitude of pests, and they're all attracted by the same flower. So we're gonna go over the three insects, and then we'll talk about the flowers that attract them. The minute pirate bugs, if you see these, again, they are your friend. They eat almost any small insect or mite. They really like thripes in the spring. Now thripes are like, if you see those lines that sort of squiggle through um, your leaves, um, and they do, just, they do a lot of damage, those are caused by thripes. And so the minute pirate bugs help with those. They also like aphids. Good to know. Mites, scales, white flies, as well as soft, body, soft bodied anthropods. The next one is the damsel bug. Again, they like aphids. That's great for me. Um, leaf hoppers, plant bugs, and then also small caterpillars. And the big eyed bugs, they like um, virtually any small insect. For an example, leaf hoppers spy and spider mites. They like insect eggs as well as mites. Um, both in the nymph and uh, as, as a nymphs as well as adults. So the things that attract these three insects, you got your caraway, your cosmos, uh, fennel, the wunderflower, and then spearmint. Um, so for, for a full list of all of the insects, the predators, and the flowers that uh, we just went over, as well as a bunch more, um, please log on to jefferson.prlib.org click on Seed Library, and then click on Garden Helps. Uh, all that information will be there, and you can even print it out. So let's talk about the wunderflower, the marigold. If nature had a magic wand, the marigold would be it. It is a perfect trifecta. It attracts so many uh, beneficial predators. It also repels some predators. For example, the root knot nematodes. If you, um, we got, when you pull up your plants, if you see on their roots like these little knobby things, those are caused by nematodes. What, what root knot nematodes do is they pierce the roots, they steal the nutrients directly from the roots, and they're also damaging that root system. So, 
the plants um, are not getting the nutrients that they need. They have an unhealthy root system as a result. And as we've talked about before, unhealthy root system equals unhealthy plant. So nematodes, they just, they live in the soil. There's nothing you can do about them except for marigolds. Um, so any, any plant or any area that you have difficulty with root knot nematodes, plant marigolds around them. Uh, you will see a huge difference. They're not going to completely get rid of your problem because remember they're, you know, it's an overtime kind of thing, um, but you are going to see a difference in, in um, the amount of root knot nematode damage. And then marigolds make a wonderful trap crop for several insects. And when we have our seminar on trap cropping, we will talk about the marigold. Um, I highly recommend the marigold for any garden. Even if you hate marigolds, go ahead and plant them. But I, I feel like the benefit outweighs any negative feelings you might have towards the, the marigold. They are just, they are an awesome plant and they do so many wonderfully good things. So once you have all the beneficials in your garden, how do you keep them there and working for you? You want to plant a wide variety of flowers. Let's start with the ones that we, we talked about um, and then plant what you love. Um, just, just plant flowers. Use flowers that are going to bloom throughout the year, um, so at different times of the year. That way you have a steady supply of nectar. Um, uh, some websites recommended that you plant um, a variety, one variety of flowers in a four by four bed and then another variety in another four by four foot bed. If you have the space to do that, great, do it. I don't. Um, my, my garden is simply just not that big. I don't have the space. Any amount of flowers is going to be good. I think I had like 10 flowers last year. <laughs> three to four different varieties of flowers, something like that. And I saw a difference and I had also no clue what I was doing last year. Um, so any amount of flowers in your garden is going to help you. And then remember, you need some pests in your garden uh, because they're food for the beneficials. Uh, you're just looking for that balance and we talked about that. So the most mentioned flowers, uh, if you want to start with companion planting, these are the ones that cover the most wide range of beneficial predators. You got your parsley and your cilantro, and we talked about that parsley being a biannual and that blooms in that second year in cilantro, how you're probably going to be continuously planting that, especially during the summer because it's just going to immediately bolt and flower, um, which is good, but you just got to keep up with it. Your summer blooming flowers, you got your marigold, your dill, your cosmos, and elysium. Marigold is gonna to continue to bloom until the frost gets it or until you repel plants. Zinnias, they bloom late spring all the way through up to fall to that first frost um, gets them. So wrapping up, we talked about how flowers do a whole lot more than simply bring in your pollinators, how they bring in those beneficial insects that are gonna help control your pest population. We talked about how the goal of companion planting was balance, how you wanted a balance between your pests and your predator so that your pests don't get out of control, and how you want nature to really work for you in this and to help you out. We talked about the benefits of how you're gonna reduce uh, your need for pesticides and even organic solutions you might just might even be able to eliminate them in your garden and then we talked about how you're going to save time and save money by doing companion planting as well talked about how specifically to do companion planting how to plant in advance of the problem and then lastly what you need to plant in order to attract uh, the predators I do want to thank our sponsors for the Jefferson Seed Library. The Jefferson Seed Library would not be possible without um, donations made by Howlington Speed and Supply Local in Jefferson, Georgia, as well as Burpee and community members like you. For more information, please check out the sources. 
the book, um, Vegetables Love Flowers, is available for checkout at the Jefferson Public Library. And then this is a list of websites that I used. If you like more information, these are good solid websites uh, to help you with your um, companion planting questions. Thank you for uh, watching uh, Flower Power, How to Entice Beneficial Predators to Your Garden. I hope it's been of a help to you and I hope you see wonderful things happen in your garden.